morning. <coughs> As you know, I'm a theologian and a teacher, but I absolutely love God's Word. I, I love it, and I know you guys do too. God's words are full of many blessings for us, and they're there for edifying us and for helping us to do better. And so this morning, I want to talk to us, and I want, to, want us to have a conversation about Paul. Now, Paul was very focused. And we meet Paul for the very first time in Acts 9. In Acts 9, when we meet Paul, he is on a mission. And his mission at that time was to get to Damascus. He was going to Damascus to, to, Damascus to persecute the children who were following Jesus Christ, Christians. He was very focused. Paul was a Pharisee, and he is considered a Pharisee of Pharisees, meaning he loved God, he followed the law, and he believed what he was doing was right. But on his way to Damascus, something interesting happened to Paul. And those of you who know the story, know that on his way to Damascus, Paul saw this great light that shone from heaven, and there was a voice coming through that light. And it said, there were voices, and there was a voice, and it said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Saul, sorry. Saul, why are you persecuting me? He fell down and he asked the question, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? And so my question to you today, who are you, Lord? And so Paul asked that question, and he got a response. And the response that he got was, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I want you to get up, and I want you to go into the city of Damascus, and there someone will tell you what to do. Of course, when Paul attempted to get up, he was able to, but he wasn't able to see. Remember that story? He was not able to see. And so the men that were with him, who had heard the voice but did not see anything, led Paul into the city of Damascus. And there he was told by, he, he stayed there for three days. Of course he was blind, he couldn't see. And I want you to, this morning with me, to, Attempt with me to uh, humanize Paul. Because sometimes when we read the story of Paul, we see Paul, but I want you to give him this morning, I want you to think of him as somebody that you knew, that you know. Paul was a man, a man on a, on a, a mission that truly believed what he was doing was right. But here he is, he was stopped in his tracks, and God is saying to him, what you're doing is wrong. What did he do? Did he continue going and say, well, Lord, thank you, but I will continue to do what I'm doing? No, he didn't. Paul, life at that moment was transformed. 
It wasn't changed. It was transformed. between transformation and change. I can imagine, and I want you to walk with me through the story, I can imagine Paul being in that, that room for three days, thinking about reassessing his life to this moment. He had been following the, the, the Lord's law, he had, see, he had killed people because he thought what he was doing was right. And here he is, stopped in his tracks and being told, you're wrong. He's, at that moment, you have to understand what was going on. He had to reassess his life. And in our own personal lives, there are times when we have to reassess our lives, isn't it? Don't we? We have to reassess. And I would imagine that's what happened with Paul. He had to reassess. He had to look at himself. And he had to figure out, what do I do next? Do I continue? Or do I... Be, chain, be transformed, and that's what he chose to do. And of course, the diff there is a difference between transformation and change. When you change, it's maybe temporary, but when you're transformed, it's a process, and there is a radical reformation and you do not revert back to your previous condition. So, change is not what we need in our personal lives. We need transformation in our Christian lives. Amen. And that's what Paul did. Paul's life was transformed. And so this morning, I want us to go with me with this transformation. This transformation led Paul to do some awesome things. Transformation is spirit driven. We cannot take credit for that. It is only through Jesus Christ that our lives can be transformed. Change is, we can change the pro, is program dri driven, but transformation is uh, God-driven. And so that's what we are looking for in our own personal lives. We're looking for the transformation, all of us, I would imagine, that is sitting here today, you're here because you don't, you don't want to change, you want a transformation, because our intention, all of us, is to be saved in God's kingdom. Amen. And so I want you to walk with me. When Paul's life was transformed, Paul's whole ministry changed. He was no longer Saul the persecutor. He became Paul the healer, the Bible studying person, the person who went from place to place telling about the, his transformed life. And during that transformation, Paul traveled. He was driven. He did not stop. And so for the next 25 years, Paul's life was totally focused on telling about Jesus Christ. Amen. In other words, Paul had a ministry. What is your ministry? What is my ministry? And whenever I read Bible stories, I always think about, I always try to put myself, you know, what am I doing? What are, what are we doing? How are our lives 
changing others because that's what Paul did. His life as a result of his transformation changed people's lives, changed others' lives. What are our ministries? What are, what are you doing in our church, in your life, so that others can see that you have been transformed by the renewal of Jesus Christ, by the renewal power of Jesus? And I know that we're getting ready to do our um, nominating committees in, process, in the process in our church. And I know that some of you will be called to do ministry. And I want to encourage you, whatever you are called to do, to do it and to do it well. Because as Christians, that's what we're called to do. We're called to have transformed lives, lives that are focused on God's ministry, lives that will transform <coughs> others into disciples of, of Christ. That's our duty. Amen. If you're a child of God, then you need to have a ministry. What is your ministry? Paul's ministry was to teach, and he had, the Bible talks about um, four missionary journeys that he went on. And those are the different places that you can see up there that he went to. And th these different places took about 25 years for him to travel. He started when he was about 34 years old. Can you imagine? And then for the next 25 years, he gave himself totally to the ministry of God. He had a job. He had to because he needed to eat. But his, ministry, but his life was focused on telling others about Jesus. And so I want to encourage us this morning that whatever your ministry is, and I know for parents, your ministry should be teaching your young people about God. Your ministry should be bringing them up in the admonition and in the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. That should be your ministry. Amen. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we accomplish. If our lives are not in focus with God's will, then we have accomplished nothing. We truly haven't. At the end of the day, if our ministries are not focused, those of us who may not have children or grandchildren, but, yet the, but if you do, then your ministry should be to be focused on your children and your grandchildren, your sister, your, your, your aunt, your uncles. That should be your ministry. I encourage you, as I said, and I'm going to repeat myself, if at the end of the day you have accomplished all that the world has to offer and you have gotten all the accolades and you have gotten your all the degrees and you have gotten all the things that you have, you have set out to do but your life is not complete in God it means nothing it really doesn't because if your intention is not to be saved in God's kingdom then, why are we here week after week after week? Why do we do the things that we do? I believe that we are here because we want to be saved in God's kingdom. And I hope that, like Paul, we will be focused and our lives will be a witness to others about Jesus. During Paul's transformation, it, it didn't just happen overnight. I mean, I don't expect any of us, our transformation, to take place overnight. It's a process of a lifetime. It's the sanctification is the process of a lifetime. It's a daily walk with God. 
It's setting our goals and meeting them. And as church members, we have a responsibility to our young people. We, as a school and a church, have a responsibility to facilitate and to be able to be a part of helping our children to be immersed in God's words. It is our responsibility, brothers and sisters, it is your responsibility to help our students, our young people, to be immersed in God's words, whatever that, whatever that means for, for your church. Whether it means that on a Sabbath morning, you're going to encourage young people to be in Sabbath school, or encouraging a parent to, um, to bring their child or children to Sabbath school. Whatever that looks like, it is our responsibility to encourage each other to make our lives full in Jesus and to immerse ourselves in God's word. Amen. Now, this process, like Paul's journeys, journey, is a daily walk. Those 25 years, you know Paul's life, it didn't just happen overnight. He had obstacles and he had difficulties here and there and everywhere, just like in our own personal lives. But he persevered, he was driven, he was focused, and he knew what his end game was. And what was his end game? To be saved in God's kingdom. Amen. Once he got it, he was intentional that he wanted to be saved in God's kingdom. And so, here we have Paul. And I, I want you to go with me as Paul traveled and had these obstacles in his life. During that time, I want you to think about the fact that he didn't have a family, he didn't, a wife, and he didn't have children. So he was kind of a loner. He had friends. But can you imagine? There were times when he must have felt lonesome. I want you to humanize him now. He must have. And he had the brethren who would come and they would visit with him and they would give him the things that he needed and they, he would be able to build tents and do whatever it was and he would eat with them, he would preach but Paul was on his own. He had Jesus, he had his friends but you and I, we have our family. And so we have that, we have that community that we can lean on. And I want you to think about Paul this morning, going from city to city, never having a true home. He never did. Did you ever read about him having a true home? He traveled all the time, all the time. But there was one thing in Paul's life that he never got. He never got acceptance. from his own brothers and sisters. He never got it. They, because, and the reason he did not get it was because they could never forget who he was in his previous life. And I think that's one of the most painful things, must have been, for me, I think, must have been one of the most painful things for Paul never having gotten acceptance. They always saw him as he was. And it's so hard, I think, for us to, um, we, we are like that. We never forget someone's past. We always seem to want to judge them about their past. We always want to bring that up. Never ever looking forward and seeing the change 
I urge you, brothers and sisters, don't do that. That's painful. It is painful. Can you imagine? Paul was never accepted by his Jewish Pharisees, the, the, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees. They never forgot that, of, and, 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 and some of the Jews, they never forgot who he was in his previous life. And so for us as Christians, our responsibility is to look at each other with whenever our lives are transformed, to look at each other with new light, new beginnings. Because God does the transformation. And when you look at someone else, not as, as they were, but what they have become, it's such a beautiful picture. Isn't it? I think it is. Um, and so here we have Paul always wanting that and never receiving it. That's my take on that. Um, and so after 25 years, Paul goes back to Jerusalem. And he goes there with the intention of telling about his exciting life that he has had. He travels back and he's really excited. And even though he was told, Paul, don't go back, he wanted to go. I want you guys to read the, one of the most exciting books I think is Acts. Read to your children or young people, read for yourselves. Acts, and, and you may read from one of the new versions, like the early, um, the, the new translations or one of those other books. Paul went to Jerusalem. And when he got there, some of the brethren, they were so excited to see him after 25 years and he's traveling and they greeted him and they were excited but you know what they said to him Paul we heard about all those things that you've done with the Gentiles come on you know he's like and here's Paul saying I have fought a good fight I, you know I've done these things and I believe that there's a crown waiting for me, but they couldn't see past that. That's not where their heads were. They were wanting Paul to explain himself, the life that he had lived with, with, with working with the Gentiles. And of course, what do we do when we want to be accepted? What do we do? Remember what he did? He took the vow. He did, right? Remember the story? He, he did what they did, he took the vow, and for four days, they fasted, they prayed, they did all that stuff. Do you think they accepted him? No, they still didn't. As a matter of fact, they tried to kill him. They plotted to kill him. Read that story. It's the most exciting story in the sense that Paul was totally and completely trustful of God. He was trust, very trusting of God. And so here we have... They were plotting to kill him. And he had to be rescued by the Romans. <laughs> the Romans took him back, left uh, Jerusalem, and took him back to Caesarea. And here he is, and he has to stand trial. For what? There was no evidence that he had done anything wrong. And so, my brothers and sisters, we in this life, Sometimes we're doing the best job we can, but we always have those critics that no matter what you do, you can never do the best job. There's always somebody who's going to find fault with what you've done. But praise God that when you do God's will, He will be pleased with you. Amen. And that's where your salvation lies, Amen. in Jesus Christ. And so we have Paul here. He went before Felix, he went before Festus, and he went before Herod Agrippa. And he is before these men, 
standing in judgment. And Paul is standing before them. And he has, and of course, he's the storyteller. He loves to tell stories. And so he goes and he, he rehearses his whole life. By the time Festus left, he was tired of hearing Paul tell the story over and over again. Don't be scared, young people, to tell about what God has done for you, about your life. Moms and dads, don't be afraid to tell how God has blessed you and blessed your children. And that's what Paul did. Paul wasn't scared. When he got before Felix, he rehearsed again because Felix kept bringing him back. Of course, Felix had a reason for bringing him back. He wanted Paul to give him money. But every time he took Paul before him, what did Paul do? Paul rehearsed the story over and over again. And finally, he was tired of it. And so he left Paul in prison. But then here comes Felix. Um, uh, yes, Festus. Here comes Festus. And he, Festus, brought Paul before him one day when King Agrippa and Bernice were, were there. And I, I love this story. I love it. It's absolutely wonderful. And here they are listening to this story. And Paul again says, stands before King Agrippa. He says, King Agrippa, I am so glad I've got this great opportunity to talk to you about all the things that God has blessed me to do. 25 years. And King Agrippa, King Agrippa sits back and he listens. And, Fest, and finally, uh, Festus says, Paul, you're mad! Because Paul is so excited and he's telling all this wonderful story. And he's telling Paul that he's crazy. Because Paul is rehearsing about Jesus about his life and how God has blessed him and how God has blessed his journey. And of course, we know what King Agrippa says. What did King Agrippa say? Anybody remember? Thou has almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Wow. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Unfortunately, being persuaded and being a Christian it's a different story. But Paul's life must have been something huh? for him to re be able to rehearse it and for this man, this king, to nearly be persuaded. But his heart, he didn't want to change in his heart. And so Paul was left in prison. They put him back in prison for another two years. And finally, we come to where Paul is journeying to Rome. And I want you to go with me to Acts 27. And in Acts 27, Paul is on his way to Rome to stand before Caesar. But even though Paul has gone through all of this, and his life has taken all these different turns, and he is with friends, he's with, he's with um, Dr. Luke is on the journey with him. As a matter of fact, it is Dr. Luke who is rehearsing or telling the story of what took place in the book of Acts. And even though I can imagine how he must have felt, he had gone before these kings, he had tried his best to explain himself, but nobody wanted to listen. And here he is on his last, last journey, but he wasn't discouraged. He's on this journey to Italy, and he has 
a an officer. It's, um, it's uh, Acts 27, verse in verse one. We read where he has a an, an army officer who is in charge of Paul, and his name is what? Julius. Julius. That's right. And Julius must have been an awesome guy because the Bible tells us that he was very kind to Paul. And I would imagine that he was kind to Paul because of Paul's life. And God gives us favor in our own personal lives. Does God give you favor? Amen. Yes, he does. God gives you favor on your jobs, in your interaction with people. God gives you favor. Christians, we receive favor from God. And it may take different forms. I don't know what forms your favor may take, but God gives us favor. And Paul received favor on his journey as a prisoner with this guy. And he allowed Paul the freedom, I would imagine, to um, do whatever. Paul was allowed to pray, Paul was allowed to talk to the prisoners, and on his journey, they left um, the port of Adramithio. Adramithio, the words. How's that work? <laughs> and they're journeying on their journey, and there's a storm. Wow. Do we have storms in our lives? Here is this storm, and you can see the journey on our, 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 our uh, screen there that he took. And his journey wasn't a straight one. You notice there was ups and downs, and they traveled back and forth. And I'm not going to go through all the different places, but what I want to say is that there was a storm. A storm of magnitude that Paul and the, the people that were on the ship and Dr. Luke, Dr. Luke talked about the fact that the storm was so bad. Please read uh, Acts 27. It was so bad that they started throwing out their supplies. That was a bad storm. If they're going to be throwing out things. So they, what do we do in our storms? Do we hold on to stuff? Do we throw out things that are we can do without? Our storms of life. Do we get rid of the baggage, the things that are holding us down? And that's what they were kind of doing. They were trying to make the ship what? Lighter, right? And so in your own personal lives, in our own personal lives, what is it that is holding you that in your storm that you need to get rid of. In this storm, they threw out the things that were not necessary, but they were necessary, but they could do without. And the story tells us that finally, they, the, the storm was so bad that they, they wanted to kill, the captain and the other men wanted to kill all the prisoners. And because of Paul, and because Julius lo loved Paul, obviously because of Paul's favor from God, he said, no, we're not going to kill the prisoners. Isn't that awesome? Amen. And so those who are around us, this is how I feel, those who are around us, when God shines his favor on us as Christians, those who are around us also receive those blessings. Amen. I want you to remember that. Amen. It's the truth. Those who are around us, who are within our sphere, when God's favor is being laid on you, they receive it as well. And that's a fact. It is. They receive the blessings as well. And so in this case, um, they received the blessings that was poured out on Paul and his life was spared. And in that 
storm, Paul was visited by an angel. And uh, Dashiana read for us this morning what Paul said to them. And he said, none of us will die. None of our lives will be lost. Because last night an angel spoke to me and he told me that we, we will lose our ship but our lives will be spared. Praise God. Amen. And so this morning, each of us, our lives will be spared if we continue on this journey. This journey of total surrender to God and to his will. Our end game is to be saved in God's kingdom. And we are going to have ups and downs. We're going to have problems here and there. We're going to have storms. But our lives will be spared because we have totally surrendered to God. Now, I want you to understand that on that ship, there were only three Christians. There was Paul, there was um, Luke, and there was, um, let me go back here. The guy that went with them from Thessalonica. Could you look it, look it up for me? I think it's, I don't have my glasses on. Um, <laughs> um, it's Acts 27 verse 2. There were just the three of them on that boat that were Christians. Our status. Yes, our status. Yes. There, they were those three Christians that were on board. And God saved everybody's life because of them. Amen. And so this morning, Paul got on his way to Rome. But of course, we remember he stopped in Malta because of the, the ship broke up and they had to go. They stopped off in Malta. And there again, we saw God's, um, Paul's life, um, healing, he was healing, he healed the officer's um, mother that was ill, and um, we see where people accepted God because of what happened with the snake being um, on Paul's arm. But, my, my focus this morning is on Paul and how he led his life, how his life was a life ministry, totally dependent on God. And I want to encourage us this morning that our lives should be totally and completely dependent on God. Amen. And I want to also encourage parents, your responsibility is to bring your children up in the admonition and the will of God. It is your responsibility. It is also your responsibility to pray for your family, to pray for your children. If they are no longer in your house, it is still your responsibility to pray for them. It is still your responsibility to pray that God will save them. It is still your responsibility to pray for your children. I don't care how old they get, it is still your responsibility to bring them to the feet of Jesus all the time, every time. And so we have this man, this man of God, on his way to Rome. And I want to end by saying this. Yes, he got to Rome. And yes, he got to uh, stand before Caesar. And yes, there was nothing he could find that was wrong that Paul had done. And so, my brothers and sisters, this morning, it doesn't matter what others may think about your journey. If your journey is all about God's kingdom, 
That's what matters. Amen. It truly is. If you are doing God's will, and your life is focused on me and preparing yourself and the, the lives of your children for heaven, that's what matters. That's your end game. And I want to encourage us this morning that whatever it is that is keeping you from a ministry, please ask the Lord to help you to do His will so that when He comes, you can stand before Him and say like Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the work. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. Amen. And not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. Amen. And that's my hope this morning, that our lives, that each of our lives, that all of us' lives, will be so caught up in the ministry of God's work that when he come he can say well done thou good and faithful servant you have been faithful in a, in a few things I will make you ruler over many things Amen, Amen. Amen. Amen.